The illustrator, Edward Ward, approached Hushkit, complaining that life seemed pointless. As he sat in the park in the rain, bemoaning the downfall of civilization, I decided he needed something to distract him. With this in mind, I gave Ed the enviable task of equipping a notional 1940s Air Force with one proviso. He could only pick from the worst aeroplanes then flying. The following are Ed's words. Picture the scene. It is the 1940s. The Republic of Hushkonia has been taken over by a benevolent dictatorship of disgruntled aviation enthusiasts. Somewhat ironically, the Air Force and national airline Air Hush remains under the control of officers loyal to the old regime. Furious with their new ineffectual overlords, yet too timid to stage a coup, they decide instead to make the Hushkonian armed forces as bad as possible, to attempt to encourage takeover by a foreign power and restoration of the old order. To add at least some credibility to their actions, they decide to choose aircraft that actually saw service in their specified roles with other nations. No crazy prototypes or mad schemes here, only tried and tested flops. On the basis of this conversation, which actually really actually happened, the fighter arm of Hushkonia was equipped with its premier air superiority asset. Long range escort fighter, Boeing YB-40 Flying Fortress. This fighter is, as you've no doubt spotted, a B-17. Imagine mixing it with the 109s in this. In 1942, the 8th Air Force thought they might create an effective escort by slinging a massive amount of guns into a bomb-free flying fortress. No aircraft has ever flown with such a formidable defensive armament. Unfortunately, this made the aircraft so draggy and heavy that it couldn't keep up with the bombers it was supposed to be protecting. In a totally relevant but oddly satisfying aside, the YB-40 is the only aircraft on this list to feature in an Oscar-winning film. Two of them appear in the scrapyard scene at RFC Ontario towards the end of William Wyler's The Best Years of Our Lives, which won nine Academy Awards in 1947. Its film career was notably more successful than its operational one, but did not save it from the scrapman's torch. Strategic Bomber Heinkel HE-177 Greif when it comes to long-range strategic bombers, there's only really one choice. Heinkel's flaming coffin, the dyslexically accurately named Greif. It is worth pointing out that when it worked properly, the HE-177 was a stupendous performer, powerful and fast. The trouble was that it didn't work properly very often. Furthermore, when things started to go wrong in a Greif, they tended to go wrong quickly, catastrophically and inflammably. The statistics are enlightening. For example, of 13 missions flown on flak suppression duties at Stalingrad, seven 177s were lost to fire, none of which were attributable to enemy action. The problem all stemmed from the HE-177's power plant. Consisting of a pair of Daimler-Benz V12 engines mounted on a common crankshaft in each wing and their incredibly tight fit into their cowlings. Both engines shared a common central exhaust manifold serving a total of 12 cylinders, the two inner cylinder banks of the component engines. This central exhaust system would often become extremely hot, causing oil and grease which routinely accumulated in the bottom of each engine cowling to catch fire. This problem was compounded by the fact that there was a tendency for the fuel injection pump on each engine to lag in their response to the pilot throttling back in such situations deliver more fuel than was required, and thus fuel the fire. In addition, the fuel injection pump connections often leaked. While the constant fires were by far the most serious issue affecting the Greif, the big Heinkel also had to contend with an overly heavy undercarriage, a dangerous swing on takeoff due to the massive torque of the enormous propellers, an inadequate defensive armament, and some very unpleasant handling characteristics. Famed test pilot Eric Brown suggested the elevator control was dangerously light and lingering concerns about its structural strength. Brown noting that it really was nail-biting to have to treat a giant like this immense Heinkel bomber as if it was made of glass. The French finished a version of the HE-177 after the war with four separate engines and it served reliably for years on test programmes, proving that if Heinkel hadn't inexplicably persisted with the coupled engine concept, they could have had an effective, reliable, strategic bomber from 1942. An amazing 1,169 of these terrible bombers were built. However, slightly sadly, none survive. Except, of course, for thousands being built for Hushkonia. Ground attack. Brida BA-88 Lienche. Do you like aircraft that can go around corners? Brida thought that was overrated. 
Proof that the adage, if it looks right, it'll fly right, is a load of old cobblers. The Lientia looked fast and purposeful, yet was so overweight, draggy and underpowered that it frequently failed to fly. On the first day of the Italian offensive against British forces in Egypt, for example, three breeders were committed from Sicily. One failed to take off and another was found to be unable to turn and therefore compelled to fly straight and level until it arrived at an airfield in Libya, which fairly evidently isn't Egypt. Later, when sand filters were fitted to the engines, the Lientia could not exceed 155 miles per hour, and there were occasions when entire units failed to take off. Various items of equipment were left behind in an attempt to make the benighted craft viable, including the rear machine gun, one of the crew, leaving the pilot all on his own, and half the fuel and bomb load. But it never worked, and the Lientia was adapted to a role it fulfilled admirably, being parked on airfields to draw enemy fire. A noble task. Reconnaissance. Curtis SO 3C Seamu. From the unlovely lines of its engine cowling via its horrible rectangular winglets to the worryingly truncated rear fuselage, the Seamu inspired a total lack of confidence. With good reason, as it turned out for the poor little Curtis, it was a dreadful aircraft. It didn't even win the competition that selected it for service. A rival design by Vought was judged superior, but Vought were busy with the F4U and Curtis had spare capacity, so into production it went. And in no small terms, as 795 of these unpleasant little aircraft were released into the wild. If it had been merely slow and uninspiring, it could have been written off as a humdrum mediocrity, but the Simi was also dangerous. Its main tank could hold 300 gallons of fuel, but it wouldn't take off with more than 80 gallons on board. Even if the Ranger engine didn't pack up, which it did, often, a bad start for a single-engined aircraft intended to mainly operate over the sea, the Seamew had other tricks up its sleeve, as, according to the improbably named Latisse Curtis, it was possible to take off in an attitude from which it was both impossible to recover and in which there was no aileron control which sounds like an enervating experience. Eventually, the Seamew became one of that select band of aircraft which were replaced by the very aircraft they were supposed to succeed, the biplane Curtis SOC being restored on the catapults of several USN capital ships. In an admirable gesture of inclusiveness, Curtis made the SO3C available with either wheels or floats so its unpleasant characteristics could be experienced equally by those on land or at sea. Trainer. LWS-6, Zuba. When it comes to ungulates, the Mustang probably got the best deal in terms of aeronautical namesakes. The Bison, by contrast, has lent its sturdy name to the Indian MiG-21 variant, a hilariously ungainly Avro biplane, and this, the Zuba, which is Polish for Bison, according to Wikipedia, though Google Translate thinks it means Oryx. Hmm. The Zuba was probably the worst training aircraft ever. In fact, it may have been the worst aircraft to enter service anywhere at any time. Plus, it was fantastically ugly. Just look at its chin and that rictus grin of windows. It's like a massive aerial Bruce Forsyth. Unlike Bruce Forsyth, however, the hideous Suba had a terrifying propensity to fall apart at inopportune moments. The problem started with the engines. The Zuba had been designed for the 420 horsepower Wasp Junior, but it was re-engined with the 700 horsepower Bristol Pegasus. A crash in 1936 led to a strengthening program which added to the weight and reduced the bomb load. Then there was the landing gear which required the crew to disconnect several of the aircraft's other electrical systems to function. Eventually it was just locked down and forgotten about, with obvious effects on the already pedestrian performance of the aircraft. More serious was the Zuba's tendency to come unstuck. The Zuba seems to have been made out of bits of whatever was lying around at the PZL works in 1936, and featured wood, steel tube, aluminium and sheet steel at various points of the airframe. Whilst not in itself a problem, there were plenty of exceptional mixed construction aircraft in the 40s, it is as well to make sure the glue you're using for the wooden bits is up to par. Sadly for the Zuba, it was not, and after dazzling two Romanian officers who were evaluating the machine with its dizzying 100 miles per hour performance, the Zuba in question simply fell apart, killing all on board. 
The factory immediately went into damage limitation and scurrilously put out a story that one of the Romanians had opened a door during the flight, though quite why opening a door should cause the whole aircraft to disintegrate was never adequately answered. An attempt to improve the aircraft by adding a twin tail failed, when the added weight of the improvements reduced the payload to zero, and thus the failed airliner turned failed bomber, failed to get its export order and chugged along training Polish bomber crews to fly better aircraft. Amazingly, those that survived the German invasion were pressed into Luftwaffe service as trainers. The last survivor of the 17 built was put into a museum in Berlin, presumably to scare the children, and it was there that it was destroyed by vastly better Allied bombers in 1944. Transport. Bristol Buckingham C1. 5,000 horsepower for four passengers. British aviation at its most economical. Plus, it handled like a pig. Airliner. Avro Tudor. Knowing that the post-war aviation world would demand shit British aircraft to take the piss out of, Avro bravely sacrificed their credibility and chief designer in the name of unassailable mediocrity. Poor Roy Chadwick was killed when the prototype Tudor II crashed, through no fault of the aircraft, surprisingly. The aileron cables had been reversed. Chadwick had designed the Lancaster and was a great loss to British aviation, but the Tudor should really have been put out of its misery long before. Despite being heavier and slower than either a Constellation or DC-4, which were already in service, the Tudor was designed to carry a lousy 12 passengers. It had an outdated tailwheel undercarriage and the four Merlins it was fitted with were not ideal for civil use, mainly due to their being amongst the loudest piston engines ever developed. Aviation enthusiasts seem to fall into paroxysms of joy on hearing a Merlin, but sitting next to four of them for 12 hours might make you think twice about calling it the sweetest sound in the world or the sound of freedom. Handling problems were never entirely fixed and the Tudor was built like a battleship. It was noisy, I had no confidence in its engines and its systems were hopeless. The Americans were 50 years ahead of us in systems engineering. All the hydraulics, the air conditioning equipment and the recircling fans were crammed together underneath the floor without any thought. There were fuel burning heaters that would never work. We had the floorboards up in flight again and again. Although the last sentence sounds like a 1930s housewife bewailing her time in a terraced house in Bradford, this was in fact Gordon Storr, the chief pilot and operations manager of British South American Airlines. The Tudor would be totally forgotten by history if it weren't for the fact that two disappeared without a trace in the spooky area known as the Bermuda Triangle. Right now, presumably, there are some disgruntled aliens with the floorboards up trying to get the heaters to work so they can resume their studies of primitive Earth culture. Maritime Patrol Saro Lerwick Elliot Verdon Rowe, who founded Avro and later Saro, was a fully paid-up member of the Fascist Party. This may serve to explain the horrible Lerwick and its effects on the RAF. You could be forgiven for thinking that designing an aircraft to fly around slowly for ages in the hope that somebody might see a submarine and then drop something on it might be a relatively simple task. But the Saro Lerwick serves to prove that apparently it is not. 21 were built, 11 were lost, 10 in accidents, 1 disappeared. Its main problems were simple lack of power coupled with an inexplicable lack of stability. The Lerwick could not be flown hands-off, which is rubbish for a long-range patrol aircraft, nor could it maintain height on one engine. It was prone to porpoising on landing and takeoff, and possessed a vicious stall. Added to this, structural headaches, the floats regularly broke off, and a woefully unreliable hydraulic system, and it becomes obvious that the Lerwick should be ordered in massive numbers at once for Hushconia. And for the fleet, carrier fighter. Blackburn Rock. The wrong concept applied to the wrong airframe at the wrong time. The rock was the answer to a question that should never have been asked. Namely, where's the Navy's Bolton and Paul Defiance? <laughs> Bolton and Paul had gone to great lengths to make their turret armed fighter as fast and handy as possible. Despite carrying around a turret and a gunner, which added about a ton to the loaded weight of the aircraft, the performance wasn't much worse than a contemporary hurricane. And although the concept was flawed, the aircraft was excellent. 
Imagine what they must have thought when the Navy asked them to mount the same turret in the less than stellar Blackburn Skua to produce an aircraft 85 miles per hour slower and infinitely less able to survive, let alone fight in the skies over Europe. Exactly how an aircraft derived from a dive bomber barely able to reach 200 miles per hour and with no forward firing armament was supposed to combat a Messerschmitt 109 was apparently not a major concern for the powers that be. Luckily for all concerned except the Luftwaffe, the ROC was little used but amazingly it did score one confirmed kill against the Ju-88 over Belgium an aircraft nearly 100 miles per hour faster than the unlovely ROC. Despite this unlikely success, the ROC remains the worst operational carrier fighter ever to grace a flight deck, and as such is a shoe-in for the noble Hosconian fleet. Carrier Torpedo Bomber Douglas TBD Devastator The Devastator's chronic vulnerability has become infamous. It was required to fly straight and level at a stately 115 miles per hour to deliver its torpedo, a speed that meant it could be easily intercepted by an SE-5A of 1917 vintage, which is somewhat unfortunate for an aircraft touted as the most advanced naval aircraft in the world on its debut. By contrast, the contemporary Japanese Nakajima B5N could launch its superlative Type 91 torpedo at over 200 miles per hour. Furthermore, the poor old TBD had a woeful defensive armament and lacked manoeuvrability. Its problems did not stop there, as its main armament, the Mark 13 torpedo, was a dreadful weapon, plagued with reliability issues and frequently observed to score a hit but fail to explode. Considered as a weapon system, the TBD Mark 13 torpedo combination was probably the least satisfactory of the entire air war. Instead of the torpedo, the TBD could also carry 1,200 pounds of bombs, thus extending the scope of its inadequacy into two roles. At least it could go a bit faster and higher when dropping its bombs. If it had never been required to enter combat, the TBD would have been nothing more than another forgettable mid-30s design. Dick Best, who flew an SBD dive bomber at the Battle of Midway, remembered the Devastator as nice flying airplane. But, like the fairy battle, it was committed to combat in a world that had overtaken it. Only 130 were ever built, a pathetic amount for a US aircraft of this vintage, and weirdly, only six fewer than the equally dismal Blackburn Rock previously mentioned a match made in mediocre naval aviation heaven. Hushkit.net only exists thanks to people like you digging in your pockets and helping. If you enjoyed this, go to hushkit.net and donate. Follow us on Twitter and tell all of your lovers.